The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. We heard the girls scream outside. A toddler slips out of her life jacket. The scream that a parent never wants to hear. And falls right into a pool. It was just like everything froze. Watch as this girl is brought back from the dead. Her body just took breath. Our week of prayer continues. And then just all of a sudden she goes, cheese. Today on The 700 Club. Welcome to The 700 Club. The uh, Interior Department put up a cross. It said, Act One, Scene One of the unfolding drama that became the United States of America. Cape Henry, April 29th, a day this nation was dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an amazing time, and when we were there, we relived that landing at Cape Henry, and then there was a cross, and we placed in the cross some microfish of some of the partners of CBN, and then we prayed, and in my life, I have never, ever had such an anointing of God. It was the power of God came upon me in an extraordinary way to say that blessing that was on this nation has been moved down to CBN. And what we did, we took a cross and carried the cross down here. And that cross is behind me right now. We see the place where it was. That's right. And there it is. That, that was the one that was from Cape Henry. That's the one that, that was the one. when and you felt that strong I, anointing. I, I, it was unbelievable. It was, but April 29th was the time that they knelt in prayer around a cross, and they said, we dedicate this land to the glory of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And the prophecy was that from these shores, they would go, uh, the gospel would go all around the world. And yeah. the prophecy of the early settlers, April 29th, 1607. Okay? I love it. I love it. And that's certainly happening today. It is. I, I mean, we, we, we're fulfilling that prophecy. I mean, CBN is reaching the nations of the world and have had hundreds of millions of people saved. Glenn, the news, keeping food on the table, President Trump is taking drastic action to ensure meat processing plants remain open, even though some have turned into COVID hotspots. What's the president's plan to keep them safe? Caitlin Berg has that story. President Trump says that meat processing plants are critical infrastructure and under a new executive order, they must remain open. There's plenty of supply. This comes as meat plants around the country have turned into COVID-19 hotspots. At least 21 facilities closed with thousands of workers sick. The president says his administration will ensure employees are provided with protective gear, but that the plants must continue operating to prevent shortages of pork, chicken, and other products. Major processors like Tyson Foods warned that if the breakdown in the supply chain continues, millions of pounds of meat will simply disappear. Keep in mind that the supply chain has three things, manufacturing facilities, the workers, and the communities. All of them suffer if a facility is down. Temporary closures of processing plants already forcing farmers to slaughter livestock they will no longer be able to sell. But industry analysts don't foresee a long-term problem. I think in a couple of weeks, we'll be in good shape as far as the supply chain goes all the way up and down the line. And I don't believe there's going to be a shortage unless people make a run like they did on the toilet paper, which was unnecessary. As the government works to keep facilities open and operating safely, millions of Americans can no longer even afford to visit their local grocery stores. Thousands are receiving food from this Hampton, Virginia food bank, and it's a scene that's played out across the country as families are struggling to put food on their tables. Charlene Aaron found that many now needing assistance are first timers. Of those that we have seen in these uh, drive through distributions, over 60% of them are new to the food bank. So these are people who have been laid off and never thought they'd be in a food line, and um, here they are. I get paid once a month. My wife is out of work because she works for Colonial Williamsburg. It is really rough out here. The Salvation Army is also seeing a spike in requests for assistance. 
We've seen some places where the demand has increased by two, three, four times. Sacramento area, we've seen an increased demand of maybe 400 percent. CBN's Operation Blessing is mobilizing to meet the need. Their hunger strike force distributing at least 40 to 50,000 pounds of food a week to local food pantries. As we looked at the impact that children being um, home from school and parents having hours cut or actually losing their jobs completely, we knew that we needed to get involved. Operation Blessing is also sending non-perishable items to area distribution centers. Recipients say being able to feed and supply their families helps relieve the burden in other areas, like paying utilities. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. It breaks your heart to think there are people in this nation who cannot afford to buy food to put on the table. And we at Operation Blessing are doing everything we can We've got that hunger strike force of those big trucks going out. We pick up supplies at the farms and bring them in. We would go out all over the country to pick up supplies. Millions and millions of, of meals being served, but we're just one of many. That we, we cannot allow this great nation that people can starve to death. It won't work. Well, there's something else. The coronavirus is hitting the uh, economy hard. From the Congressional Budget Office, it says the GDP may go down as much as 40 percent. But uh, the lockdowns have delivered a body blow to the economy. And John Jessup has the latest on one estimate on the shrinking GDP. Here's John. That's right, Pat. The economy began shrinking rapidly as the shutdowns took effect, falling at an annual rate of nearly 5 percent at 4.8 percent in the first quarter. That's according to today's first government estimate. But the real impact won't show up until we get the numbers for the second quarter from April through June. That's when lockdowns went into full force. But the stock market, though, has been climbing, anticipating an economic recovery. Well, the disappearance of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is raising questions about that country's future, including the fate of its Christians. A new report by a U.S. commission says religious freedom does not exist in the communist nation. 50,000 Christians there are locked away in prison camps. CBN News spoke with the Family Research Council's Tony Perkins, who serves on the commission. He said Christian groups will be ready to help North Korea's people if the country opens up. We certainly pray that the doors open to North Korea, and I think yes, the answer is uh, is yes. I think we saw back in uh, the when the the wall came down in the early 90s, uh, when uh, in, in Eastern Europe and Christians and and other people of faith moved into those regions to meet needs and to uh, share the faith. And so I think, I think there's going to be opportunities if that comes about in, in North Korea. Kim has been out of the public eye since early April. And Pat, that's led to speculation that he's either dead or incapacitated. Um, he's a short man and he weighs over 300 pounds. He's an inveterate smoker. Uh, he has every indication of somebody who's could be incapacitated. I think that he supposedly have had some kind of cardiovascular procedure. Did he die? Is he is he infirm? Did he have a stroke? Nobody knows. But he's he's not in the uh, in the scene. If he did pass away, uh, who would take his place? Well, his sister, and she's meaner than he is. You're kidding. Oh, she, she doesn't she, look like it, though. Oh, man, she is tough as nails. <laughs> she's already been sanctioned by some of the international bodies on her feeling. Wow. But that place is just a, uh, uh, well, it's a charnel house. And what's being done to people is just horrible. So we will, we should pray constantly for the Christians to be set free of that oppression because the oppression has been unbelievable. And again, Kim Il-sung, who was a grandfather, was a lieutenant colonel who was put in place by the Russians at the time of the Korean War. And they idolize him now as some kind of a deity. But he wasn't a deity. He's a lieutenant colonel put in by the Russians, mm -hmm. Kim Il-sung. But his family has taken control of that nation, and it is probably the most oppressive on the face of the earth. And it's one thing we cannot cover up. It's something that needs to be. And if there was ever something to be prayed for, is to pray for the liberation of the Christians in North Korea. John. 
Pat, back here at home, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is taking heat for his criticism of the Jewish community after hundreds attended a rabbi's Brooklyn funeral. New York City police were dispatched to the chaotic scene in the city's Williamsburg area to deal with the crowd of ultra-Orthodox Jews filling the streets and violating the city's social distancing guidelines. Mayor de Blasio issued a series of tweets including one specifically, call, specifically calling out the Jewish community. It read, my message to the Jewish community and all communities is this simple. The time for warnings have passed. That message caused backlash though. Jonathan Greenblatt, a former US special representative tweeted, generalizing against the whole population is outrageous, especially when so many are scapegoating Jews. Texas Senator Ted Cruz and political commentator Ben Shapiro questioned if de Blasio would have made the same comments about other religious communities. This just one day after Attorney General Bill Barr issued an order to, quote, be on the lookout for state and local governments violating constitutional rights by overly strict COVID-19 guidelines. Well, after nearly a month, the U.S. naval ship Comfort is preparing to leave New York City. The crew showed its agility when its original mission to relieve pressure from COVID-strained hospitals quickly changed. CBN News national security correspondent Eric Phillips has the details. This is a look inside the intensive care aboard the Comfort during its mission in New York. Workflow picked up when crew members learned they'd be treating coronavirus patients. The switching to that of uh, all comers or both COVID negative and COVID positive uh, was, was a little taxing for some at first. Uh, you know, again, because of we all watch the media, we see what's going on on television and the concerns and the issues that were going on around the country. In the Navy, we're very adaptable and we're good at change. Uh, so we were able to make a lot of those, uh, well, necessary adjustments to what we were doing um, very quickly. Including new protocols for moving patients on, off, and around the ship. Not to mention new standards for protecting the crew against the spread of the disease. Even still, we had a couple of our crew members that also became COVID positive aboard the ship. Uh, so we were able to, to separate them, care for them, uh, get them what they needed, and they've actually returned to duty. So that relieved a lot of that stress and anxiety that some of the crew may have had. Of the ship's 180 patients, 70 to 80 percent were COVID positive. For some, like native New Yorker Malcolm Burtz, the job was personal. My grandmother's in Yonkers, which is highly affected. I, I think about it often, just being so close yet so far. And though the staff is built for combat, fighting this invisible enemy became overwhelming at times, with as many as 25 patients on ventilators and others on dialysis while needing to perform surgeries on board. It happened all at once. It's something new. It challenged us from the sheer volume and the, um, the realization that we don't have a good treatment protocol for it yet. It is frustrating, but it's a privilege to care for people, even if you don't have tools that you know can fix them. What they really need is care. We really feel that uh, we have made an impact uh, to the city and the people of New York and New Jersey. No one would argue with that. And now with all patients released, the comfort is scheduled to head back to Norfolk by the end of the week. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. Pat, we certainly appreciate their service and the service of all the people serving on the front lines. It was so moving when it, it took out from Norfolk and went up to New York, and it's fulfilled its, its calling, and it'll be back in the fleet ready to serve in combat to help wounded soldiers and sailors and Marines and so forth uh, in some kind of combat situation. But they want to get it clean of all that uh, mm. COVID uh, uh, residue, and I think it'll take quite a while to, to make sure it's, it's completely sanitized before somebody else comes in there. Wendy. All right, well, still ahead, a sunny day by the pool turns tragic. What happens after a dad hears a scream that a parent never wants to hear? Find out as our week of prayer continues. But first, Matthew Barnett joins us. How has his Dream Center in L.A. responded to the COVID crisis? And how on earth did he survive running seven marathons on seven continents on seven consecutive days? He'll tell us all about it when we come back. Well, as co-founder of the L.A. Dream Center, 
Matthew Barnett has been serving the homeless population in Los Angeles for more than 26 years. It's a community that has been hit hard by the coronavirus. Matthew is meeting the needs of those vulnerable people by following the nudge of the Holy Spirit one small step at a time. Take a look. 26 years ago, Pastor Matthew Barnett's dream became a reality when he co-founded the Dream Center in Los Angeles with his father, Tommy Barnett. The center reaches more than 30,000 people weekly with its needs-based ministries and outreaches. But Matthew says this dream might have never become a reality if he had chosen to ignore God's nudge to help those around him. In his latest book, One Small Step, Matthew encourages you to bring life to a broken world by focusing on the needs of others, even when it doesn't always make sense. Well, please welcome back to the 700 Club, the author of, of One Small Step, Matthew Barnett. Matthew, your dream center is working in Los Angeles where over half of the California deaths of COVID-19 have occurred. Why do you think LA has been so hard hit? Well, I definitely think the homeless population has played a major role. We're about a mile away from it, and uh, we're just seeing so much need every single day. Right here at the Dream Center, we're feeding people seven days a week, 11 hours a day. Can you imagine? Mm. Every day for 11 hours, we're feeding 14,000 people that are driving by, the homeless that are walking up. To be honest with you, it almost looks like a, a horror movie where people are so broken, they've lost everything. They're coming through our line to get food walking up to get food from the streets. I've never been in an era like this in my entire life in, 20, in 26 years of ministry. And to be honest with you, when, they, when we shut down a long time ago, California, and when they decided that they're going to shut down services, I thought this could be the end of the Dream Center in the flesh. And then I thought, you know what? We're going to go out fighting. If it is the end, we're going to go out fighting. And so I put my desk on the sidewalk. I said, we're going to feed as many people as we can on Monday, three days after the announcement was made. Well, to our surprise, God began to bless us, and we've been able now to go for 45 straight days of feeding people every day for 11 hours a day. You know, in your book, you talk about following the nudge of the Holy Spirit. How did you get involved? You didn't have any money, and here this big property is available. How did you get the money? Well, what ha it started with just moving my desk on the sidewalk as a pastor. That's all the ministry I had was a desk. And then we had one little house. I started taking in people that had drug problems and, and ministering to them. And then one day I was driving down the Hollywood freeway. I see this big old landmark hospital, the icon of Los Angeles called the Queen of Angels. And I went in and I just talked to the Catholic Church. And I said, you know, we have a dream to have a church that would never sleep. That would be open 24 hours a day. Would you sell us the building? And they agreed to sell us the building for $3.9 million rather than $16 million that Hollywood was going to buy it for. And then I called my dad. I said, Dad, it's good to have a, a dad who can do things, right? And I said, Dad, I need you to help me come up with $3.9 million in 18 months. That's all I'm going to ask you. Not, not a big deal, right? <laughs> but he actually, he actually stepped up, and we started to preach and go across the country. And I really feel like the reason why that this building is happening is because God has allowed me to be a pastor's son of three great generations. And as a part of that responsibility of being a pastor's son is to give, is to give resource to people in our community who have no voice. And that's the purpose of the influence I believe God has given me. Well, your f father, Tommy, is a dear friend. And what he's done, I yeah. mean, he just started with buses. And the next thing you know, he got more buses and more buses. And he's got that huge church in Houston. It, as I say, it, you see it, it looks like something from out of space landed on the mountain. It's a huge <laughs> church. So, so you, you had a good background. I do, a very good background. And it's, I think it's caused us uh, during this time that we're in right now to really just you know, respond to the, the nudges of the Holy Spirit. Those little things in your heart that don't make a lot of sense, but you know that it requires faith. And uh, we're seeing it happen. I mean, 425,000 people we've been able to feed during this time, um, 45 days again in a row. And I just can't even tell you that I think we were born for a moment like this, though, as a church. We were born to step out. Even our, our mayor and everyone's coming together saying, how in the world have you guys been able to be three days earlier than the public school system that started feeding meals? We were there three days before them. That's making up the need of these children that don't have meals. And so... Well, growing up around Tommy Barnett, it's taught you to understand that man's need is God's call for the day and to step up and to respond. 
and uh, and to not to be willing to take a chance and take a risk on risky situations when it comes to helping people and making a difference. And we're seeing that happening. In, in this book, One Small Step, you talk about a man who challenged you to run a marathon in seven different continents, and you were injured and you kept doing it. How did you do it? Well, it was I was running for the people at the Dream Center. It was a, during a time where we were really struggling uh, the ministry because we added 200 more beds for the homeless people. And so we were str I had to literally empty my bank account to keep the ministry going for one more month because I think we expanded a little too fast. But a guy sent me a text message and he said, hey, why don't you run seven marathons and seven continents in seven days like these people are? And I said, that's crazy. I I've never done anything like that in my life. And he said, I'll give the Dream Center $100,000 if you say yes to this. And suddenly I felt led by the Holy Spirit to go do it, right? And I trained for nine months. I know the Dream Center had tons of need. And we started in Antarctica as content number one. We went to Chile, Miami, Madrid, Morocco, Dubai, and Australia. I tore my patella tendon on marathon number four and found a way to lock my left leg and run like Frankenstein the whole rest of the way. All the way to my seventh marathon, I finished all seven in seven days on every continent of the world, even negative 30 degrees. 50 mile an hour headwinds in Antarctica. And uh, it's just all these things, man. The, the Dream Center should not be alive in this climate, in this neighborhood, this community. For 26 years, it doesn't make sense. But when your heart is into something, when you're willing to give your entire life to something, anything is possible when God knows that you're not going to give up on the people that you love. Well, I think the Lord's hand is on that whole thing. This book, One Small yeah. Step, you've written quite a time. What's the main message you want your readers to get out of it? Just not to be afraid to step out on ideas that are that are maybe against what you think you're capable of doing and not being afraid to minister uh, to minister to people in ways that might be outside the ordinary and, and and not to negotiate with these impressions of the Holy Spirit that come into your life that tell you to do good that's maybe even against your nature or the familiarity of your life and to get outside your comfort zone and, and start, start to say yes to more things in life rather than justifying all the reasons why you can't do something. Well, you said yes to a lot of them. The Dream Center is fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, renowned all over the world. And Matthew's book is called One Small Step. It's available wherever books are sold. Matthew, God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. And it's a joy to be with you. If people want to be a part of the relief efforts, they can go to dreamcenter.org and it would really help us to go a long way to feed a lot of people. This could be going down until the fall in California. So we're up against a big challenge. Well, they're there. And isn't it wonderful? God bless you. What a great guy. What a great guy. What an incredible ministry. And I'm still trying to figure out how he did the seven marathons in seven I mean, days. He has to lock his leg in place, and he's toward his patella uh, tendon. Only the Lord could have helped him oh, to man. do that. But Remarkable. Okay, Wendy, what's next? Great interview. Well, coming up, a toddler slips out of her life jacket and sinks underwater for several minutes. She survives, but severe brain damage leaves her blind and unable to speak or walk. How does a wildfire prayer ignite a miracle? Stay tuned to find out. But first, the real story of America's first settlers, and you won't read it in most history books. We'll commemorate the Cape Henry landing after this. On April 29th, 1607, 1607, after a 144-day voyage, a brave team of you of settlers landed at a place called Cape Henry in Virginia Beach. It's about 16 miles away from where I'm currently sitting. Well, shortly after arriving, they had squabbles on board, and their ch chaplain. Robert Hunt said, I'm not going to have communion until you guys get straight. And so they confessed their sins and they asked to have love for one another. And on April the 29th, they planted a wooden cross on the shores. And they say, we claim this land for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This land was claimed by God. It's his country. Keep that in mind. So let's look back at that historic day 
and see why it's so important to all of us today. April 29, 1607, a nation was born. Travel-weary Englishmen landed at Cape Henry on the shores of Virginia and lay the foundation for what would become the most powerful country the world has ever seen. Act one, scene one of the drama that was to be the United States unfolded that day at Cape Henry and sparked the legacy of godliness on American shores. Almighty God, by your great mercy, we have reached this land, which we now claim and establish for thy eternal purposes. We ask thee to open hearts and enlighten the understanding of the peoples of these shores to comprehend the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. America's destiny and purpose were sealed with that cross at Cape Henry. All that would follow in our nation's growth hinged on the single proclamation that this land belonged to Jesus Christ. In the Mayflower Compact of 1620, the pilgrims reaffirmed the mission set forth by the original Virginia settlers. They said, we have come here, first of all, for the glory of God, secondly, for the advancement of the Christian faith. We could say they were missionaries. They weren't just running from something. <laughs> there was a vision pulling them forward to advance the Christian faith in this new world. Later, the Puritans carried the Cape Henry legacy further. On the deck of the Arbella, halfway between England and Cape Cod, leader John Winthrop declared, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. They were going to America to live out a new kind of government and Christianity where people govern themselves. They don't depend on an outward government. They would depend primarily on governing themselves according to Christian principles. We ask now that your kingdom come to earth and your will be done as it is in heaven. And to that end, we claim this land for that great purpose. Amen. Amen. More than a hundred years later, as America set off on her own course towards independence, the godly foundations laid in Virginia established the character of our revolution. John Adams boldly proclaimed, Before God, I believe the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready to stake upon it. And I leave off as I began, that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God, it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now, and independence forever. George Washington's pure Christian heart, Benjamin Franklin's call to prayer, and John Adams' reverence for the will of God symbolize the undying commitment of our founding fathers to the creation of a nation which would glorify God. The American character was born in Scripture and nurtured by the Holy Spirit. Yet today, our national heritage is under siege. The moment that religion, the pure undefiled religion, loses its influence over our hearts, from that fatal moment, farewell to public and private happiness, farewell, a long farewell, to virtue, to patriotism, to liberty, Bishop James Madison, 1795. More than 400 years have passed since America was first conceived at Cape Henry, and respect for our roots is growing cold. Yet one undeniable fact still remains. At its core, the United States of America is a Christian nation. On this solemn anniversary, I want us all around this country and around the world to pray this land is now being torn with division. There's hatred and animosity. Uh, there's confusion. And there's desperate, desperate problems with this virus that's come upon us. And we need to pray for the power of God, the same God that led those settlers here on April the 26th, actually. It was, they got here three days earlier, and then on the 29th, they, they dedicated the country. 
But we're going to join right now. And I ask you to join with Wendy and me as we pray, and we're going to believe God right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we join once again in front of the cross that came from Cape Henry. And Lord, we ask that you would take this land that is yours. Reclaim your heritage, Lord. And we declare in the name of Jesus Christ that this land belongs to him. It was given to him, and usurpers would try to take it away. And over the years, they have tried in terrible times. But right now, we declare that this land belongs to the Lord. And it was dedicated to him, for him, by those who loved him. And so once again, we claim a blessing on April the 29th, this day of the founding of America. Lord, do it again. And may the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God come and bring peace and joy and righteousness to this land that was supposed to be a city set on a hill, the, the wonder of all the nations on earth. Restore in, unto us the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. And amen. Wow. That's awesome. Done. <laughs> Done. All right. Well, turning now to this story, a scream that a parent never wants to hear. That was the sound that sent a shocking chill through Chris Love. His 14-month-old daughter was floating lifeless in the family pool. And for the next nine minutes, his wife, Danielle, fought to bring breath back into her baby's body. Danielle and Chris love sharing a meal on the patio with their four daughters, a weekly tradition at their home in Florida. So on August 7, 2018, the couple prepared dinner as usual, while 14-month-old Isabella played outside near her sisters who had been swimming. But the peace of a seemingly perfect day was interrupted. We heard the girls scream outside, the scream that a parent ever wants to hear. Somehow, the toddler slipped out of her life jacket and went into the pool unnoticed. She had been underwater for several minutes without air when her sisters found her floating with no sign of life. Danielle, a trained water safety instructor, administered CPR. It was just like everything froze for a minute. I would breathe and then I would scream, God, I need you. I was doing CPR for over nine minutes with nothing. And finally, it was like God just put breath in her lungs. She didn't wake up or anything like that, but her body just took breath. And by that time, the first responders were there. Her mom was doing CPR, but in most cases, it's less than like 25% that there's a survival rate. Of course, we had to start an IV and I intubated her and then we flew her out. Isabella was life flighted to a Tampa hospital where it was determined she had gone through the five stages of drowning. Her heart was barely beating when she was placed on life support. Refusing to give up on their daughter, Danielle and Chris called on people from all over the world to pray and believe for a miracle. Pray something happened to Isabella. Just from that one little text, it basically started like a wildfire prayer. And within 15 or 20 minutes, we had people praying. So our first prayer was, God, we will serve you regardless of what you do. Our second prayer was just that the Lord would give us strength to get through each day. And um, our third prayer was for complete wholeness. So they prayed and waited by her bedside. Miraculously, Isabella made it through the night. Then her heart stabilized, and on the third day, she awakened from her coma, three months sooner than the typical timeline. But doctors said she would never be the same. She was diagnosed with severe brain damage that caused cortical blindness and the loss of motor skills. Will she ever be the same baby again? She lost her speech, she lost all her motor skills, she couldn't walk, she couldn't couldn't see, um, so that was a big fear. We had had so much bad news from doctors. They had three neurologists on the case, and the first neurologist that came in said brain damage to both sides of the brain, full brain damage. I told him that, you know, I wasn't gonna have, if he could just say brain change for now, that would be great because I wasn't gonna have him speaking, you know, brain damage over her. I mean, we knew that we served a God that was able. And 
So we would just pray, we would pray, God, you did not bring back our daughter from the dead to halfway heal her. Like we would not accept any halfway healing. The couple prayed with anticipation. Then on the seventh day, a smartphone recording captured a breakthrough. There were small glimpses of where we thought she could see us. And the doctor said, no, that's not possible. We kept trying to argue with the doctors and just say, no, she's seeing us. Like, and this was kind of our, you know, just to build our faith. So we were holding up the camera and recording her, and she was just kind of oblivious. She wasn't really looking at us, and we were like, come on, Isabella, hey. And then just all of a sudden, she looks at us and just locks eyes, and she goes, cheese. Cheese. And we're like, what? And we just started crying. And <laughs> That was probably the first thing that she had done before the accident that she had, was able to do again. It was tears of happiness, because we knew I mean, that was a big step. She, God had healed the blind in that moment. From that day on, Isabella astonished the medical staff with her rapid rehabilitation, accomplishing six months worth of rehab in 31 days. On September 6, 2018, she returned home and just a couple months later, she had made a full recovery. We always say that, you know, God brought her back and she's even better. She's completely healed, I mean, 100%. Actually went to the neurologist and they said, you know, for her follow-up appointment that we didn't need them because he was blown away. Just seeing the progressions that she's made, where she's at now, just a complete miracle. That without God, my baby would not be here today. She is just full of personality, full of energy. I mean, she's nonstop. She's a handful, but I'm thankful. Today, they continue a family tradition of gathering around the table with their girls, a precious answer to prayer. Our family would not be the same without Isabella. Like God knew that we needed to keep her. To, to God be the glory to, from beginning to end. Only God, that story is truly amazing, but it shows you the power that we have as believers when we pray God can do miracles and astound the doctors That's and right. everyone else. Well, I love it. This is our week of prayer, and we've got thousands of prayer requests that have come in from all around the country and around the world. Somebody said, I need healing for stage three deteriorating kidney disease. Somebody has got Parkinson's and asked for healing. And somebody said, my daughter, granddaughter, both have COVID-19. Mm, here's some uh, safety for Israel and peace in Jerusalem. Mm. Healing from traumatic brain injury. And this one, comfort and peace for those mourning the loss of loved ones. And there's a lot of that right now. Folks, we're going to ask God. We're surrounded by the prayers of thousands of people. This is a week of prayer. And I have in front of me just a, a, some of the thousands of prayer requests that have come in. Now, God knows your need. He looks down on you, and He knows your need. And He is moved with a feeling of compassion because He senses what your problems are. Now, Wendy and I are going to agree together, and we're going to believe God for miracles all the way across this world. We're going to believe God for miracles. So I'm asking you to agree with us on this special day. Mm, thank you, God. Father, I join with my sister in Christ, and we pray together according to your word. You said if two of you would agree on earth as touching anything that they would ask, it'll be done by my Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you. And Wendy, you have something. Yeah, there's somebody. You've been told that uh, your job uh, will not come back after the, the pandemic, but God is saying it will come back. Don't fear. He's going to provide for you. You will be employed. And Jesus. Somebody, uh, you're claiming the Abrahamic covenant. I, I don't quite understand what it is that's going on, but you're claiming it, and God's going to give you the answer to that covenant the covenant of Abraham that has made over the centuries in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The neck muscle that just got healed in Jesus' name. And, and somebody else has a, a pulmonary embolism. And God has just taken that embolism and it's, it's, it's dissolved in the name of Jesus. Touch them. 
point de Horan. There's someone you're crying out for a miracle right now. You just saw the story on the little baby who came back and you you're saying, God, I, I need that. And the Lord's hearing your prayers right now. And there's it's something there's a medical emergency, but God is touching and healing right now in Jesus name. Be encouraged. There's a knee problem. The patella thing is, is loose and, and uh, it's not sitting as it should in your kneecap. And right now, just place your hand on it in Jesus name. Charlie, it's yours. Thank you, Father. Now, Lord, all over this nation and around the world, people are crying out to you. They're asking for healing for their loved ones. They're asking for defense against this COVID-19. They're asking for help and uh, jobs, and they're hurting financially, and they're, they're desperate. And I ask for peace to come upon them, and I ask for their prayers to be answered. Lord, you are almighty, and there's nothing impossible with you. So today we affirm your power in the name of Jesus. Receive an answer. Yes, Lord. And may the glory of God come upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. I was so moved when they brought all of these prayer requests over to us just a few minutes ago, Pat, and if we can show them again, because yeah. like you said, it's just a fraction, but mm. everyone is precious to the Lord, and we are lifting all these needs up. Amen. I amen. love it. Well, guess what? Our dear friend Sheila Walsh is the featured speaker at CBN's Week of Prayer Chapel today. We'll be live streaming the service at noon Eastern. To, to watch it, all you have to do is go to CBN.com or you can join us live on Facebook or YouTube. While you're there, you can check out the full list of speakers for this week. We've had amazing speakers every day. We'll be praying for the requests that you, our partners and viewers, have sent to us. If you haven't sent us your prayer request yet, it's not too late. Just give us a call at 1-800-700-7000 or you can just go to CBN.com. Well, still ahead, a Wednesday round of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Michael says, why was it unlawful for Paul to discuss his encounter in heaven, but now everyone who goes there writes a book about it? That's a great question. Stay tuned for Pat's answer and much more coming up. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Hillary Clinton is the latest Democratic heavy hitter to endorse Joe Biden for president. The former Secretary of State and 2016 Democratic presidential nominee joined Vice President Biden in a women's online town hall Tuesday. Clinton's endorsement comes as new testimony has surfaced, supporting an accusation of sexual assault from a former aide when Biden was in the Senate. The campaign strongly denies those allegations. Well, Israel celebrates its 72nd anniversary as a modern nation today, but without barbecues and parties because the country is under strict coronavirus curfew. Israelis are forbidden from traveling more than 100 meters from their homes, except for essential needs. Today's anniversary comes after the country marked Memorial Day Tuesday, honoring fallen soldiers and victims of attacks. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Ken Allison is an award-winning movie producer. He's also a CBN partner. Why did Kent decide to join the 700 Club? because he wanted to be part of something bigger than himself. Take a look. Kent Allison is a two-time Emmy Award-winning filmmaker whose work has aired on MTV, NBC, and HBO. But he especially appreciates the work that he and his wife helped to support as partners of CBN. One thing that CBN and the 700 Club do immensely well is to mobilize people and resources. I mean, we have Operation Blessing. We have Helping the Home Front, Orphan's Promise, the Superbook. Uh, so I know that when that money is directed toward them, that they are gonna be the most amazing stewards of that money. For Kent, supporting CBN as a 700 Club member is just one way he likes to thank God for the success he's seen in life and business. Having been in business for 23 years, there's only one place that I can attribute that to, and that's to God. The blessings that I've received have been too, too many to, uh, to count. Kent says partnering with CBN means he's part of something bigger. There are so many things that CBN does 
that I know I, I could not accomplish, that I can't get done. It allows me to be a part of such an amazing body of Christ. I know that in some small way, my directing his money to CBN is absolutely the best thing to do for me. Amen. We appreciate that testimony. And so many people feel just like he does. You know, they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. If that sounds like you, then please go to your phones right now and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day. $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBM partner and to help so many hurting people all over the world. And as you know, this is a great time to give and help hurting people. When you do that, we have something special for you. If you sign up for Pledge Express, that's where your bank does all the work. And you, you don't have to lick a stamp or, or write a check uh, every month. It comes right out of your checking account. When you sign up for Pledge Express, we're going to send you this every single month. It's called Power for Life. These are monthly teachings from Pat and Gordon that will really revolutionize your walk with the Lord and build your faith. So sign up for Pledge Express when you call. Pat? Okay. It's time well, for email. I think it's time for email. All right, let's go. Let's go. Here's Michael. He says, hello, Pat. Why was it unlawful for Paul to discuss his encounter in heaven? But now everyone who goes there writes a book about it. Uh, first of all, I question whether some of these who written the books have actually gotten there. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, I was caught up into the third heaven, and I saw sights and sounds that it was unlawful to talk about. So that's what he said. He got there. The other guys who written the books, I, 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 I just question some of them. I, I don't have any idea. So, yeah. I, you say, if it was unlawful for Paul, if he really saw stuff, he said it was so splendid I couldn't talk about it. Well, I think these ones who written the books haven't seen quite anything that's splendid. All right. All right. Here's Stephen. He says, my older brother often watches fictional and true crime TV shows to the point where I'm very concerned about the effect they're having on his spirit. Doesn't the Bible command us to guard our hearts and protect our eyes from wicked things? Oh, uh, it indeed says that in the Psalms. It says, I will put my eyes upon no evil thing. And uh, I think that we can absorb stuff like this. You know, a lot of fictional books are full of, of, of things that, I mean, they've got incest, they've got rape, they've got murder, they've got plots, they've got all this stuff, and it's part of fiction. Well, I, I think our minds should be on something else, all right? Amen, I agree. Roger says, I'm a pastor, and I've worked with Christian college students at a university for about 13 years. Last year, I read your book, The Secret Kingdom. Recently, I ordered your book, 10 Laws for Success, and I'm waiting to receive it. Do you think either one or both of those books would be good books for me to recommend to Christian college students? Well, they absolutely should be recommended because the Lord gave me that. I mean, that whole idea of the secret kingdom, I was praying, God, show me how your kingdom works. And he, he showed me uh, laws that Jesus had said in the Bible. I, and these are very practical steps for success in life, for building a family, for living happily with your spouse. I mean, it's tremendous. Every one of them should be read. I'm thanks for the endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> they are great. Well, Mario says, when Jesus told us to pray, he gave us the Our Father prayer. I have visited many types of spirit-filled churches with born-again believers, and I have never heard the Our Father being prayed. Saying this prayer is a command from Jesus. Why do these churches not obey this command? Look, how should I know what these churches are doing and not doing? Uh, you, you know, uh, that's the model prayer. Uh, it's, it's, it wasn't Jesus himself, but it's what he said. Here's when you pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but I, I, it's personal. Why don't, you know, how, how can I say, how come churches don't do something? I don't know why they don't do it. I, I've been to plenty of churches that prayed this. Well, but, sure but, but I, I think it's more for us to pray. I, I mean, you can pray it corporately, but. Yeah, well, it's your own prayer, and you can break it down. It's, uh, you know, all these things. It's a wonderful prayer. All right. Kevin says, Dear Pat, it's hard for a person to study God's Word. Plus, I need some help on how to listen to God. Any suggestions? I think he's uh, distracted. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think what you need to do is take a verse, take even a phrase in that verse, and read it over and over again until it begins to speak to you and it begins to be part of you. And, uh, you know, 
they taught us in seminary, you, you overlook, a, you, you look over a book, you read it fast, and then you take little parts of it and you break it down. I don't know. That's the way to, to make it part of you. Let that word, you know, he talked about eating the word and it becomes part of you. You, you, you absorb it. You know, if you, unless you eat my flesh, I mean, that's the idea. It becomes part of you and you savor it over and over again. All right. All right. Good advice. All right. Uh, Riddy Ann, I believe, uh, is her name. She says, hi, Pat. My son needs a healing miracle, and I keep praying every day. Am I not showing enough faith by praying every day for the same thing? Should I just leave it in God's timing? Well, you know, you know the Bible, it's present tense in Greek. Keep on praying, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. The, the, when God finally says, I've done it, then, then start praising him. Until he says, I've done it, keep on praying. So keep on praying. You know, George Muller prayed for somebody to get saved. He prayed virtually all of his life. Finally, after his death, the man came to the Lord. Wow. So if you believe God, but the, one of the things about praying, we have to confess what we've done. You know, if, if, if you confess with your mouth uh, the Lord Jesus, and he said, you believe in your heart that you have, and you'll have the thing as you say. So make sure that you have in your heart and again, are you praying for the glory of God? Or are you praying for your own satisfaction? Make sure that when you pray that you're praying for the glory of God. All right. All right. Here's one from Sandy. She says, I'm born again. And the Bible says you will go to heaven if you're born again. I'm also a sexual abuse survivor on two different levels from a stepfather and from strangers. I'm from a very toxic family as well. And I struggle with this. I'm, I may die and not have forgiveness in my heart for this stuff. So does that mean I'm not going to heaven? Um, I don't know what's in your heart for sure, but I do know that being born again involves being forgiven. And if you, Jesus said, when you pray and you have ought in your heart against any, forgive as your heavenly Father might forgive you. So you've suffered terrible abuse. And what you need to do is, is begin to pray for those people. You know, if you say, God, keep me Help me not to hate my father for what he did to me. All you're thinking about is hate of your father. But if you say, God, I want you to bless my father with the power of God, then all of a sudden you've changed it into something positive instead of negative. Okay, try that. Well, today's power of is from the book of Nahum. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Well, for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us. It's always good to have you on the 700 Club. Another exciting show tomorrow. Don't miss it.